I was just trying to catch my flight at the airport when a Karen accused me of carrying a bomb in my suitcase. The situation quickly escalated as she refused to believe me, and I could feel the tension building. Here's how it all went down. I was heading to a business meeting and decided to take a plane to get there faster. I arrived at the airport with plenty of time to spare, but I was feeling a bit anxious about the flight. I had never been a fan of flying, but I knew it was the quickest way to get to my destination. After checking in my luggage, I made my way to the gate. I was focused on getting to my destination and didn't pay much attention to the people around me. That's when I heard a woman's voice behind me say, Excuse me, sir, you can't bring that bomb on the plane. I froze. What was she talking about? I turned around to see a middle-aged woman with a fanny pack staring at me. What are you talking about? This is just my suitcase, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I saw you put something suspicious in there. I demand you open it up right now. The woman, who I would later learn was named Karen, said, I couldn't believe what was happening. I was being accused of carrying a bomb in my suitcase. I tried to remain calm and reasoned with her. You're mistaken. There's nothing suspicious in my suitcase. I'm just trying to catch my flight, I said. Karen was having none of it. She kept insisting that I open my suitcase and show her what was inside. I knew I had nothing to hide, but I also didn't want to cause a scene at the airport. The tension was palpable, and I could feel the eyes of other passengers on us. Then, Karen continued to insist that there was a bomb in my suitcase, and I continued to try to reason with her. You're being completely unreasonable, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. Look, there's nothing in here that could be used as a bomb, Karen scoffed. I know what I saw. You're trying to bring a bomb on the plane. I was getting frustrated. I don't know what you think you saw, but I can assure you that there's nothing in my suitcase but my clothes and toiletries. Karen was not convinced. I demand to speak to your manager. You're putting everyone's lives in danger. I sighed. I didn't want to cause a scene, but Karen was making it impossible. Fine, I'll open it up, but I hope you're ready to apologize when you see that it's just my clothes and toiletries in there. Karen nodded smugly. I knew it, she said. I unzipped my suitcase and opened it up to reveal my neatly folded clothes and toiletry bag. See? There's nothing in here that could possibly be a bomb, I said, feeling a surge of satisfaction. Karen was undeterred. That doesn't prove anything. You could have hidden the bomb somewhere else. I was incredulous. Are you serious? I don't have a bomb. You need to stop this. Karen's face was red with anger. Don't you dare talk to me like that. I'm just trying to protect everyone on this plane. I took a deep breath. Listen, I understand that you're concerned, but you're making a scene. There's nothing in my suitcase, and I just want to catch my flight. Karen wasn't having it. I demand to see a security officer. You're a threat to this plane. I was at my wit's end. Fine, I'll go get a security officer. But I'm telling you, they're going to tell you the same thing. There's nothing here. Karen nodded triumphantly. I'll wait right here, she said. I rolled my eyes and walked away, trying not to let my frustration show. This was not how I had expected my day to go. As I walked towards the security checkpoint, I could feel the stares of other passengers on me. They had all witnessed the altercation with Karen, and I could tell that they were on my side. I located a security officer and explained the situation to him. He listened patiently and then asked to see my suitcase. I opened it up, revealing my clothes and toiletries once again. The security officer inspected the contents of my suitcase and then looked up at me. There's nothing here, he said, echoing my earlier words. I breathed a sigh of relief. Thank you, I said, feeling a weight lift off my shoulders. I turned to walk back to my gate, but Karen was still there, waiting for me. What did they say? She demanded. I glared at her. They said there's nothing in my suitcase. I told you that from the beginning. Karen looked taken aback. Well, I still think you're up to something, she said, clearly not ready to give up the fight. I shook my head in disbelief. I don't have time for this. I'm going to catch my flight. And with that, I turned and walked away, leaving Karen standing alone in the airport. I breathed a sigh of relief as I walked away from Karen and towards my gate. The entire ordeal had been exhausting, and I just wanted to board my flight and forget about it all. As I walked, I could feel the eyes of other passengers on me, and I knew that they had all witnessed the altercation with Karen. I tried not to let it bother me, but I couldn't help feeling self-conscious. When I reached my gate, I took a seat and tried to relax. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath, trying to calm my nerves. But try as I might, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I kept replaying the argument with Karen in my head, trying to make sense of it all. As I sat there lost in thought, I heard a voice behind me say, Excuse me, sir, can I sit here? I turned around to see an elderly woman with a kind smile on her face. Of course, I said, gesturing to the seat next to me. The woman sat down and introduced herself as Mary. 
We started chatting, and before I knew it I was telling her about the argument with Karen. Mary listened sympathetically, and then shared a story of her own about a difficult person she had encountered while traveling. As we talked, I could feel the tension and anxiety of the earlier encounter melting away. Mary was kind and understanding, and I felt grateful for her company. When it was time to board the plane, I said goodbye to Mary and boarded the plane feeling lighter than I had in hours. Thankfully, my conversation with Mary was enough to lighten my mood enough for the business meeting I was going to have the following day, and things went successfully. A lot of time has passed since then, but I'm not going to lie. I still think about the strange interaction I had with that Karen, and it still infuriates me to no end. Wherever she may be now, I hope she's not accusing anyone else of carrying bombs. Great story. That Karen sounds like a nightmare. I can't believe some people can be so unreasonable, but I'm glad it all worked out in the end and you were able to have a successful business meeting. I'm a single man in my early 30s. I've got a brother who's 29, and he's already got four kids now. He had his first at 22, and the second followed a year later, then the third two years after that, and the fourth is the most recently born a couple months ago. His wife, my Syl, and I do not get along as she always likes to try and get a rise out of me by acting superior, then turns into an extreme self-victimizing drama queen if I retaliated against her in any way. She can cry in an instant and can put on an extremely convincing show to get sympathy from just about anyone. My parents and brother absolutely adore her, even though they know exactly how she really is and just don't care. She's very good looking, I'll give her that, but she's so awful that I could never be attracted to her. She also refuses to get any sort of job, even though she has a college degree, and my mother willingly helps with the kids all day. So, their finances are entirely dependent on my brother. This also means they can't afford to live anywhere but my parents' house. And privacy is a bit of an issue with all of them under one roof in a three-bedroom house that was built in the 60s. Growing up, my younger brother was also the obvious favorite. We're three years apart in age, but he developed a superiority complex because I was badly punished if I retaliated against his antics in any way way back then. It was obvious my parents cared for him a lot more because he got the lion's share of everything unless people called them out on it, which did happen a fair bit by other members of family, which is why my parents packed us all up and moved us about 150 miles away from them, so they generally only would only see us on holidays since it was a three-hour drive. My brother got physically abusive towards me on a number of occasions, flirted relentlessly with my first girlfriend to the point she broke up with me, and laughed at any misfortune I had. And my parents just told me to suck it up whenever I was upset said about it. I only got equal treatment when my parents wanted to keep up appearances. I admit it was rather funny to see the looks on their faces whenever they had to treat me equal to my brother on birthdays and Christmas because other people were present. We had relatives that were very nosy and loved gossiping drama, so my parents did their best to hide what was really going on and threatened to take all my stuff away if I didn't keep my mouth shut. If anything, it just made my parents celebrate more when I turned 18 and moved out because it meant they no longer had to provide for me. I wasn't even done with high school yet when I moved out, but couch surf was far better than living with them. I was low contact ever since leaving home. They didn't even show up for my high school graduation, but I really didn't care. From that point on, I would usually only see my parents and brother on holidays like the rest of the family. The start of the 2020 pandemic was not kind to me. I lost my job and couldn't renew the lease on my two-bedroom condo because my roommate also lost his job, and neither of us could afford the place on unemployment money. I loved that condo, but as the lease was ending, my roommate left to move back in with relatives, and I had to sell nearly all of my stuff because I was soon going to be homeless if I didn't downsize. I shouldn't have rented a place that expensive, but I liked living the high life. Until life wasn't kind to me, and I realized I should have been living somewhere far cheaper so I could have saved more money to fall back on. But I had a plan. I own a truck simply because I've always loved them. So I found a dollar one thousand camper in good shape and put it on my truck so I could live out of it for a while. It was supposed to be temporary, but I ended up living out of it far longer than I ever thought. I was hoping to be able to live out of the camper at my parents' house, where my brother and his family still reside. But when I asked my parents to let me stay for a while, they told me they had a full house and didn't want me there. Plus, we hadn't exactly gotten along in the past decade. They said they'd only agree to let me park my camper there if I paid them basically what it would cost to rent an apartment in my area. That was way too much just to park my camper. I was jobless and trying to save as much of my unemployment money as I could until I could find a new job. I might as well have been living in an apartment with that rent price they were asking. My parents called my camper an eyesore and told me to take a hike since we couldn't come to an agreement. Syl thought it was funny I had to live in a camper, and my brother joined her in pointing at and mocking me while calling me a homeless bum. I parked my truck and camper in a store parking lot to sleep on the first night that I had nowhere else to go. I felt scared out of my mind that someone might try to break in. 
Suffice to say, I didn't sleep well that night. There was nowhere else I could go as any other relatives that owned houses were fairly far away, and all my friends lived in apartments. And I was pretty attached to my area as well, so I didn't want to just leave. I also had my mail forwarded to a friend's apartment. It was the only way I could still get my mail. Finding a stable place to park was pretty difficult. I went looking around to try and find a job similar to my old one. It took months of living the nomadic camper life. In that time, I had to deal with a lot. Everything from beggars and drug addicts to people demanding I leave because my camper was an eyesore. At one point, someone who told me to move claimed to be with an HOA. I wasn't even parked on a street with houses. And when I questioned, asterisk, asterisk, what HOA, they got incredibly belligerent and threatened me. I moved my camper anyway just to avoid the trouble. In order to have a steady supply of electricity, I learned to use a long extension cord to plug in anywhere I could to recharge my camper batteries. This meant sneaking around and plugging it into an outside outlet of a random building while parked on a street. I know that's a crummy thing to do, but I had to keep my batteries charged so my refrigerator would stay cold. I had a small solar power bank for recharging my phone, but I didn't have anything like a generator, and generators are noisy and require fuel anyway, so I did what I had to do. After months of living like that, I finally managed to get a new job. I had to move to the neighboring city to find a job that didn't involve retail. I worked retail while in college and promised myself never again. Though I was nearly ready to break that promise, I was still getting unemployment money, but I had no stable place to live while receiving it, and I didn't want to still be jobless when it ran out. Plus, I was bored out of my mind. I had little else to do but read, watch movies on a small portable DVD player, use my phone or laptop, and keep note of where I could park and what local public bathrooms I could use. I kind of envy that the Japanese have public bathhouses. We could really use stuff like that over here. When I finally landed a new job, I practically lived in the back lot of the building by the warehouse in old employee parking spaces that no one else seemed to bother using because they were so far in the back that the area was borderline forgotten. My boss, company owner, actually liked this arrangement because I was willingly available to take any shift I could get so long as I had enough sleep. He even let me take the camper off my truck and set it up in one of the spaces so I could drive around without it. I'm not exactly sure if this was legal, but no one bothered us about it. The entire time I lived back there, I didn't have to deal with many trespassers. There were a few, but the security guards escorted them out. I was pretty much on call almost all the time when they needed me, and was working virtually every day of the week. My boss let me plug my camper into the building for power and water, and I paid a small amount of rent by working for free on Sundays when no one else was in the office but the janitor and security guard. Beyond that, I usually had to shower at a friend's apartment or at my local gym as the camper didn't have a shower in it and only a portable toilet. And I didn't want to fill it because emptying it is a nasty chore. So I used other bathrooms as often as I could. I had a key to the warehouse and could go in to use the bathroom there at any hour. I was even on a first-name basis with the night security guard. He has since become one of my closest friends. The camper was easy to heat in the winter with a small electric heater. Summers were not fun, though. The camper didn't have AC, so I had to get a used portable air conditioner just to make it bearable. I made a lot of overtime pay and hands-on learned some new skills from other employees. Eventually, midway into this year, I landed a better position in the company as a supervisor and started making a better salary than my old job. That's when I decided I wanted a house. The scare I'd gotten from losing my condo made me realize I needed something much more stable for the long term. I looked around for something close to my work and just two miles away found a three-bedroom manufactured home on a small property. But I managed to get it for $10,000 less than the asking price somehow. I used nearly my entire savings for a down payment and got approved for a home loan. I finally didn't have to live in a camper anymore. There was enough space for me to back my truck in behind the house to take the camper off to set it up in the backyard. So I put it there as its own little building just in case I want to use it again. When I was fully settled in the house, I was foolish enough to boast about it on social media. My family saw the post, and that's where this mess started. After a few weeks, my parents and brother, along with his family, came to visit unannounced and demanded a tour of my home. I didn't give them my address, so I have no idea how they found out where I live. None of my friends have fessed up, and no prior family members visited me before that. So I wonder if they stalked me at work and followed me home or something. It wouldn't surprise me. Once I opened the door, they practically barged their way in and made themselves at home. They all kept poking around, and my sister-in-law had this creepy smirk that she repeatedly flashed at me. And it was only later that I figured out why, and it made me angrier than a bull on steroids that just got stung by a hornet. My parents were constantly talking about how I have too much extra space now, and how it's too much for someone like me who has no spouse or children. My brother kept remarking about how there was more space than our parents' house, and my house was closer to his job. These were all red flags, I know. 
Eventually, my brother asked me to speak privately. Everyone else suddenly left the room and went out onto the front porch. That's when I realized they had planned something. My brother, let's call him Dan, said the house was too much for me alone and I should let him move in with his family because his wife is pregnant with their fourth child and my house is closer to his job. He pointed out that I already have the camper, so I could just live in that outside while they live in the main house. And I'd like to point out that Dan never once spoke of offering rent. Mind you, he has a good job. He also started talking about how there would be changes, curfews, and that I couldn't just walk in at any time without prior notice. If it weren't my brother, I'd think the person I was talking to had lost their mind. But Dan lost his marbles long ago thanks to our parents treating him like he was the center of the world. I tried to speak, but he kept talking over me as if I had no say in the matter. There was no way in hell I'd rent my house or parts of my house to him. Other people maybe, just so I can pay the mortgage off more easily. But certainly not him or his unpleasant wife. I've heard of this exact kind of situation in videos online many times and never once did I think I'd actually live it because I thought it's so ludicrous. But my parents, brother, and sister-in-law, S-I-I-L, do all fit the bill for a bunch of narcissistic entitled crazies. So I picked up my phone and set it to start recording, then just held on to it. Dan didn't even seem to care or notice that I'd done this and just sat there with his arms waving around while talking about all the reasons why he needed my house. Then went from saying that to acting like it was a done deal and trying to reach out his hand to shake mine. That's when I finally showed my backbone and said, asterisk, asterisk, hell no. And I said it loud enough that Dan stumbled backward for a second. I had rarely ever raised my voice to him on that level because I was punished by our parents whenever I did. But this was my house, not theirs. My spine can be as shiny as it wants here. I stood up and then told him that my house was not up for grabs. And acting like I'll let him move in just because they want it won't make it happen. I bought my house for me and it's not my fault he keeps having more kids and has to keep living with our parents because he can't afford to move out. Dan got as physically close to me as he could without actually touching me and said that I didn't deserve the house and he needed a better place for his family to live. I laughed back in his face and said that was total crap because I worked hard to be able to buy my house. Of course, I deserved it. Dan started yelling that I have no wife or kids and I don't need all the space, so I may as well give it to him. I said I'm not giving him anything, and he never even offered to pay me rent. If I let him move in, I'd still be covering the entire mortgage on my own house without even being able to live in my own house. Then Dan told me that he shouldn't have to pay rent because his family comes first, and our parents said I was going to do this, and that I will. I yelled, asterisk, asterisk, as if their word was law or something, and told Dan that they did not have the right or power to give my house to him. Then right on cue, my parents and C.O.L. barged back in through the front door and surrounded me to try and force me to agree. There was a lot of fighting, but to sum it up from this point on, I heard the line, asterisk, asterisk, just do it for Dan, asterisk, asterisk, way more times than I can remember. In the fight, I told them all they don't have a say in my life or my house, and to get out before I called the cops. Sale screamed the loudest at me about how she was pregnant again, and I can't do this to her. I said I did nothing to her. She just assumed she could take and take from me like I would just allow it. I had no obligation to her or her family. Then I called her a stuck-up jerk who never had any respect for me. So I don't care what she thinks or how many kids she has. I have no sympathy for her. She won't be living in my house. Well, that made her angry enough to attack me. She got in one good hit on my face and tried to do more, but my brother held her back, kicking and screaming. She kept demanding he let her go, so she could scratch my eyes out. The phone I was holding recorded pretty much everything, so I held it up and said I was going to call the police if they didn't leave right away. My parents told Dan they were leaving. Then my mother said that I had a week to come to my senses. I told her I won't be, and to not come back. Then I told S.I.L. that my phone recorded everything, and if she tries anything, I'll press charges for assault. She screamed at me and then stormed out loudly crying with her face in her hands. My mother was the last one out the door and said that I better do this for Dan and S.I.L. I responded by telling her I won't be. After I kicked my parents, brother, and C.L. out for trying to force me to hand over my new house to my brother, I immediately went to my social media and told the story to the whole family. It spread pretty fast, but you won't find it now because it all got deleted some time ago and I put my own profile on private. I posted about it because I knew that the first thing my family would do when they got home is try to twist the event to make me the villain. And I was exactly right, but I had about an hour to get started before them, and I had video evidence to back up my story about what they'd done. Being preemptive worked because I got a fair number of family members on my side right away. My parents, brother, and Seal must have been all set to write their own post, but it was too late, so they didn't even bother trying to lie much.
My parents, Dan and C.I. Well, had a few flying monkeys supporting them, but not much else. Plenty of others knew how entitled they already were. So what happened was something they all quickly understood and accepted. There was one person in particular that called me. I don't know who they were, but they ranted at me that I was a horrible brother and I needed to make way for a real family man. I just ended the call and blocked the number. This didn't repeat. The week went by and my parents showed up with Dan at my front porch just like they said they would in their prior ultimatum. They rang my doorbell like crazy and also pounded on the door until I finally answered. I opened it just a crack and they tried to shove their way in again, but I'd installed a couple of latch chains that prevented it and even braced my body against the door for good measure. My father and brother demanded I let them in, but I said I was recording everything on camera and would call the police if they tried to force their way in again. My mother calmed them down, and then in her most sickly sweet tone, asked me if I was ready to let my brother move in. I told her and the rest of them to back off and never come back. My mother put on the crocodile tears and asked me why I can't just do this for Dan because he's my beloved brother. I laughed and then bluntly said I do not love him as a brother because he treated me like crap for years, and they only encouraged him to do so. They are terrible parents, and he is a terrible brother. Then told them to leave or I'd be calling police ASAP. They all left surprisingly easily, apart from my mother's loud crying and the others giving me dirty looks. One could say making them leave was suspiciously easy. I thought the whole mess was over, but I guess I should have taken them more seriously because they had other stupid plans. I came home later that week on Friday evening to find a moving truck and my brother's minivan parked in my driveway. It was Dan and his family there moving stuff in. He just waved to me with a crap-eating grin when I saw him. I was furious and told him and the rest of his family to stop. But C.L. smugly said to me that like it or not, they were moving in. And then in the most fake way, while tilting her head and puckering her lips, she said that it was okay because my mommy allowed it. And I should always listen to what my mommy tells me. I seethed with rage just hearing those words and looking at her smug, bitchy face. So locked myself in my truck to call the cops right away. When they realized what I was doing, Syl started pounding on my window and yelling at me to stop and that I can't do this to her because she and Dan need the house. And she cried, asterisk, asterisk, why can't you just do this for Dan? I responded with, to hell with asterisk, asterisk, Dan. It's my damn house, not his. Then she threatened to key the side of my truck unless I stopped calling the police. All of which the 911 operator heard thanks to the window being slightly open. I told SIL if she damaged my truck, I'd sue her. And she was smart enough to retreat. When the police arrived, Dan and SEIL along with their kids had locked themselves in my house. I told cops what had happened, as well as showing them my new driver's license that had my current address on it. Then when we went to my front door, I saw that they'd changed the lock. And the old lock was laying on the porch with the center of it drilled out. And the drill they used was laying right next to it, with a complete Harbor Freight drill bit set. Could they have been any more stupid leaving evidence out like that? I pointed out the broken lock and drill, then gave the police a rundown on all the events that happened prior. Well, I guess Dan called our parents over at some point after I arrived home, because they showed up while I was talking to the cops. My parents immediately lied and started saying that I'd agreed to rent my house to my brother and his family. I said that was an easily provable lie one way or another. So Dan and CL finally came out of my house with some papers in hand. They both looked super smug, like they'd somehow outsmarted me. They'd actually drawn up and printed out a fake rental agreement, but my signature was not on it. There was one, but it looked nothing like my handwriting. I don't think any of them have ever actually seen my signature, so that was incredibly stupid on their part. I told my parents and Dan that was stupidly blatant fraud, and if the cops investigated, they'd easily figure that out. And I don't think going to jail and court would do them any good. It could even make Dan lose his job, which is his only means of providing for his family. I also said I would get a lawyer and sue for damages if anything of mine was lost, stolen or broken, and I'd call CPS too for good measure. Dan went white and looked really scared when I said all that, but my mother got between us and doubled down about how I should just do this for Dan and live in the damn camper so they can finally have a family home to themselves. I yelled at her that if she thought it was such a good idea, she could do it for Dan herself and let Dan have her house to himself instead. The cops separated my mother from me and I said I wanted them all out right now or I'll press charges. I stated in a shout about how they drilled out my front door lock to break in. The lease papers were obvious fakes. They badly forged my signature. And I have recorded video of Sill attacking me. Those are felonies I could ruin over their lives with if I wanted. And if they didn't leave, that's exactly what I'd do. The only reason I hadn't already was for the sake of Dan's kids. So they have one chance to get out. The moment my parents heard that, I think it finally clicked that they could not force me to do it for Dan.
My mother surrendered and said she'd put an end to this. Then she went over to CL and spoke with her quietly for a minute while my father spoke to Dan. SEL instantly started loudly crying and ripping up the fake rental papers into tiny bits and tossing them like confetti, only to have an officer tell them to pick up the bits of paper or he'd cite them for littering. Both of the cops at this point had the asterisk asterisk I don't get paid enough for this looks on their faces. Dan had to start telling his kids to load their stuff back into the moving truck. The kids were all crying and the eldest was sobbing that he won't get his own room now. Sill and Dan gathered their kids up to try and make one last pathetic attempt to guilt me with the sad family routine. You know, where they all gather together in a sort of group hug while all facing one direction. I swear, I think they'd practiced it beforehand. All of the kids had the same pleading look with quivering mouths. Sill kept rubbing her pregnant belly and tilting her head to look like a sad puppy. And my brother just made the saddest face he possibly could and said, Asterisk, asterisk, please don't do this. We need to be able to live here. But I didn't falter and told them to keep packing. All the kids and Sill turned the crying up to 11, and Dan yelled at me, Asterisk, asterisk, are you satisfied with yourself? You've denied us a home because you're too selfish to share and help out family. I ended up laughing like a maniac and retorting that what he was trying to do was taking, not sharing. And no amount of crying will make me let his family move in because he's no brother of mine anymore. He's just an entitled prick who thinks he can take whatever he wants from me like when we were kids. Dan started F-bombing me until the cops told him to cool it, or he'd be in cuffs regardless if I wanted to press charges. He sucked in his lips and looked a mix of afraid and supremely pissed off. I asked the cops if they could stick around until my parents, brother, and Sill had all left. And they said they had no intention of going anywhere until this had been resolved. In fact, in the next few minutes, two cops became four, as more drove in for whatever reason. That gave my parents some extra incentive to get moving. I made Dan give me the keys to the new lock he'd put on my front door. Though I got another lock the next day anyway because I didn't know if he had copies of the keys or not. He was really reluctant to hand them over. Then instead of handing them to me, he actually threw them down the street and into a storm drain while saying to go get them myself. But one of the cops scolded him for that and made him go get them. He had to pull the grate off just to get at them. And he got pretty dirty in the process. When he got the keys back, he just grumbled then slammed them down into my hand. I then told them all to leave and never come back. My mother said I'd be disowned for this, as if that were some kind of threat to me. And I voiced that to them. Then in an overly sarcastically, I said something along the lines of, asterisk, asterisk, oh no, that means I won't get to come to any holidays with you guys where I always get treated like crap by you all anyway. Because Dan has always been your obvious favorite. You treated all me so badly when I was growing up that if Dan ever needs an organ donor, I wouldn't give him anything. So do like you always told me to do when I was mistreated by all of you and suck it up. My parents were floored after I said all of that. And the quartet of cops were looking pretty judgmental at them as well. I tell you, if you want to put nasty parents like mine on the spot, confront them in front of cops. Because they'll likely not try anything really stupid then. My mother just started crying and walking away. My father just stood there looking like he wanted to hit me. And Dan just held his kids in defeat. Oh, and Syl was off having a tantrum in my front lawn. Soon enough, they all formed a line handing out boxes and got their stuff out of my house. Nothing had been unpacked yet, so it all was taken out pretty quickly. But while doing it, my mother kept saying it wasn't too late, and I could still do it for Dan several times, each time trying to bargain more and more to try to make me change my mind. She said that Dan could pay me rent if I let them stay, and when that didn't work, she said I could move back in with them to let Dan rent my house so I wouldn't have to share the building. I told her to shut up and keep packing boxes because I don't want Dan or his family around, I don't want his money, and I certainly don't want to live with him or my parents ever again after the way they treated me when I was a kid. Making a deal with my parents would be like making a deal with the devil to me. Sill ended up having another tantrum after hearing that and threw a box down, then sat on the ground to have a pity party because she didn't want to go back to sharing a house with my parents. And she just sat looking angry, sad there until everyone else was finished. She didn't even want to get up when it was time to leave. They finally got everything out of the house and into the truck. So before they left, I laid into my parents one last time about all of the crap they put me through growing up. And with four cops being right there, they couldn't do much other than stand there and take it for once. I called them out on so many things that happened, and even pointed out how they couldn't just do something nice for me, like letting me stay over with my camper when I was homeless and trying to get back on my feet. How they let Dan and C.I.Y.L. ridicule me and call me a bum. Well, who's the bum now? 
They wanted to kick me out of my own house so Dan could stay in it free of charge, yet when I needed a place to go, they wanted to gouge me for more than I could afford just to park my camper when they knew I was out of the job. There were more extremely judgmental stares from the cops when I said all of that, so I put my parents on the spot one more time and asked them what I ever did other than being born to deserve being treated so badly. Because when I finally have a bit of success in life, they want to snatch it away from me for their favorite child, since they'd rather I give everything to Dan and have nothing for myself. I bought my house using the money that I earned. I owed them nothing, and I won't be asking anything from them ever again because clearly I will never be anything more than a doormat or a cash cow in their eyes. I got no answers from them. They just stood there looking like fish out of water. So I continued ranting and asked them what in God's name made them think they were such good parents after all of that. My father was beat red, but more from embarrassment than anger this time. And my mother was crying that she was a horrible person. I bluntly agreed that she is a horrible person. They all are. And I bet they'll go to hell for it too. They were crappy people. And they all knew it. But if I'd called them out on all this stuff in private instead of in public, they'd just get mad at me and still act like I'm in the wrong. They just kept up the denial for so long that it became a part of who they are. My mother buried her face in my father's jacket to cry, and my father looked more defeated than I've ever seen him. Dan and his family avoided me entirely as they finished putting everything back in the moving truck. I made sure nothing of mine was stolen. Not that I'd had a chance to get much furniture yet. I was lucky to even have a couch at that time. They all got back in their vehicles, and Syl just stood staring at me with malice until my brother finally got her to drive the minivan home. And as soon as they were all gone, I got back online again and spilled the beans what happened. My parents were too embarrassed to even try and defend their actions this time. And while the family was somewhat split before this incident, it was now a landslide in my favor. Nearly all of the family has sided with me after this incident. And those who haven't simply aren't siding with anybody. No matter how much my parents previously tried the asterisk asterisk we did it for Dan asterisk asterisk line, no one listened anymore. So any remaining familial support they had is now gone. Many in the family who I expected wouldn't side with me did. That includes the former flying monkeys. So I guess they've finally had enough. Around that time, I offered to host half the family at next Christmas Eve in my new house. My parents were not invited. I wasn't blocked on my brother and Sea Isle's profiles, surprisingly. And I saw Syl had her fourth baby in early November. They are still living with my parents. I'm pretty sure they knew I was watching, because Syl kept making passive-aggressive posts every couple of weeks or so about not having enough space while living with my parents, probably to see if she can still guilt me. And I'm sure it's driving my mother and father up the wall because they aren't getting any peace and quiet in their old age with three rowdy, obnoxious kids, a mentally unstable Ciel, my golden child brother, and a newborn baby in the house all at once. Perhaps they could move into a camper in their own backyard and let Dan take over their house completely. They might get some peace then. Yeah, they could do that for Dan. Can't believe some people think they can just take what they want from family members. Good for the person standing up for themselves and their own property. And the fact that they had video evidence? Genius move. It's sad that some families have to go through this kind of drama, but it's heartening to see that so many others in the family rallied behind the victim. Hopefully this serves as a lesson to entitled family members everywhere.